Hello, uh, welcome to the second lecture today at uh, Red Bull Music Academy Weekender in Belfast. Uh, I'm very honored to be joined by uh, house music, hip hop, in the UK pioneer, Noel Watson. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I wanted to, I guess, uh, begin in Belfast because you grew up here for the first 18 years of your life. Yeah, I, I, I was born in Belfast and I grew up here. Um, I left Belfast around about 1979 uh, in the summer, just after my 19th birthday. What do you remember about growing up here? Um, obviously, London is a big part of your life, but I'm wondering, you know, before that, what was this city like growing up? Well, I came from uh, a community in East Belfast, a Protestant community that, uh, you know, during the 70s, because of the troubles and everything that was happening here, uh, all the, the different uh, aspects of, of over the, the war in Northern Ireland. Um, it made growing up in Belfast really interesting, actually, in one respect, because, you know, you were watching what was happening on the 9 o'clock news or 10 o'clock news at night that was actually occurring in your street or your neighbourhood that you were actually a part of as well. I mean, when I was a young boy, I got involved in it because you do, because I was a working-class kid from Belfast, and, you know, that was part of my culture and part of my upbringing. Um, but luckily enough, you know, it, it wasn't, I didn't partake in that sort of uh, thing very often or, or not after I was about 13, 14, because I was only a child then. Um, and once I realized what was going on and what was happening, um, I realized this has got to stop. You know, um, this isn't good at all. It's kind of uh, detrimental to a lot of things in your life. And, you know, it was scary in Belfast at times as well. Um, you know, if you were going out at night in the town centre, as Terry said earlier on in his, in his talk, it was absolutely deserted, you know, the streets were deserted and the people that were hanging around were a little bit dodgy, so to say the least. Um, so you had to be very careful. I, on the other hand, um, my mother and father were very liberal thinkers and my father was a free thinker and my mum actually became a Jehovah Witness. So I had a very strange upbringing because we were just, it was, it was very odd, you know. But um, we, my brother and I both worked in a tailoring business in Ann Street in Belfast when we left school, um, a Catholic family business. And my brother would make the, the suits and, and the clothes and I worked downstairs and I would measure the customers up and I ran the dress hire company and blah, blah, blah. And it was, you know, at night we'd go to Bangor and at the weekends we'd go to a bar called The Viking, which was in, I think, Anne Street, or the little, one of the little streets that runs, I can't remember the name of it, but it was an upstairs bar, and on Saturday we'd all meet there, and we were all young Americans. We, we had already got into the, the, the fashion that was happening in parts of London, and we had, a, Morris and I met this guy who would bring us plastic sandals and Bowie jackets and bits and pieces from London, and then, you know, we were only about 15, 16 at that point, and then basically, uh, we would then travel back and forward to London if we could save up some money and go on shopping trips and then come back and go out and hang out and party here in, in Bangor. Fashion is a big part of growing up for you. Obviously, you were doing this tailoring business and you were quite interested in it. Where were you going in London specifically and looking to uh, store-wise, fashion-wise? This to sex. Um, Malcolm McLaren, Vivian Westwood shop sex. It was still sex then, actually, just before it became seditionaries. And Acme Attractions and Robot. The King's Road was the place that you would go to then. That's where all the really cool shops were. And you would maybe go into the West End occasionally. But we lived for going over to the King's Road. And that's where I, when I eventually went to move and moved to London, I got a flat in a place called Onslow Gardens, which is close to the King's Road and in Kensington and Chelsea. So that was the epicenter then of cool and fashion and punk rock and, you know, um, it was amazing and really vibrant and an incredible 
experience because it was so different to growing up in Belfast and just seeing all these different types of people and cultures and the whole aspect of, of life there was just so amazing. I fell in love with it immediately. I, I, I lived on a riverboat over in Richmond uh, on the Thames. That was the first place I stayed in. Um, and it was just beautiful and, and getting up in the morning and then traveling into the town center and going to King's Road and things. And it was just really good fun, you know, and uh, something completely different for us, so. You also you know. moved, when you moved to London, you were looking to get in the music scene. What had you been doing already in Belfast, musically, uh, before then? Uh, Morris, my brother, ran a club night in a place down just outside Bangor called um, the Crawford's Burn Inn, I think it was called. Um, and he put on a little disco there and we would play indie music and alternative music and things like Kraftwerk and The Slits. And we ran a couple of little nights there when we were just kids, you know. And this is the late 70s? This was about 77, 78. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, then, and so we were, and we had a band, we had a house in Hollywood um, that we all lived in, uh, me, Morris, Ruth Priestley, the Stockman brothers, uh, or the Priestley brothers, and Harry Binns, and um, who was Tom Binns' brother, who Tom Binns is now one of the biggest jewelry designers in the world. He lives in LA, and it was through Tom that I met Malcolm McLaren when I went to London. Uh, so it was all interconnected, and we would put on parties at, at the houses that we lived in, in Shepherd's Bush, and Hammersmith and things, and start to get, that was the sort of, before we started doing the illegal warehouse parties, you know? Um, in the, the, the late 70s, obviously, you were listening to electronic music, like Kraftwerk, but also you were quite into post-punk and industrial things that were coming out. Yeah, well. I mean, when I was a kid here living in Belfast, you couldn't really get many independent seven-inch punk rock or electronic records, so I would send off for them meal order through the NME and things like that. And, you know, I buy singles by bands like Pink Military from Liverpool and uh, Why Heat and Throbbing Gristle and Cabaret Voltaire. Because the first albums that I got into as a boy were Roxy Music. Uh, I was a big Roxy Music fan. And then I got really into Iggy Pop and David Bowie, especially Low and The Idiot, the, the trilogy series. Uh, and then more ambient work like by Brian Eno and people like that. So, and also listening to John Peel and listening to the radio, you'd be into dub and reggae and, you know, we're hearing black music as well. Peel, you've mentioned it before, it was a huge touchstone for you and in into introducing you to a lot of this stuff. What's that? This dub, reggae, and I guess black music in general. Yeah, um, I mean, I just got that one day, it just, you know, that you just, you listen to something and you just realize, my God, this is, this has just touched me some way and this music is incredible. I can't believe it. I can't believe how they make this, the rhythm of it, you know, it's so energetic, it's so life affirming. And listening to early Roy Ayers and Stevie Wonder albums and uh, then getting more deeper into black music, uh, it just took over my whole life. So tell me about the first couple of years in London. Obviously, you had some friends, you knew Malcolm McLaren, you were getting into a scene, I guess. Um, well, what happened, how that all panned out was basically when Morris and I moved to London together, um, because he had the tailoring skills, he worked then in a shop in Big Street called Demob. And Demob is an incredibly important shop and aspect of the whole subculture of music and club in the club scene in London. Um, next year, uh, as a the, the, the project I'm working on at the moment with a, a company called Test Pressing, um, and Test Pressing are a very chic and hip kind of organization that has, it's a design company, record label. Um, and they, they, they're involved in many aspects of, 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 of culture in London. Um, and basically, I'm losing my thread here, but it's kind of we, Morris worked then for the shop DMOB, and through, through DMOB, it, there was a guy called Chris Brick who ran DMOB. He suggested that we put on a, a night, a club night or a party 
for because so many people were coming to the shop and it was it was beginning to become like a scene on a Friday night just down at the shop. They had a big room at the back and it was curtained off. And basically, if you were in the know and you knew you could go in behind the curtain, have a drink, there was drugs, you could smoke, the, you know, uh, there was coke. There was a recording studio downstairs. All the movers and shakers were coming in and out. And it was just this bohemian kind of hip scene. So they suggested that they, they put on a night. And the first night we did, they asked us, Morris and I, would we DJ for them? Because they knew we had records and uh, we were into hip hop and black music. And they said, would you play? And we played. And it was at the Electric Ballroom in Camden. And it was rammed. It was, you know, it was really a very successful night. So from that, we then, they then decided to start doing regular parties, but doing them illegally in warehouses. And this was the early 80s we're talking yeah, about. This here. is around 83, 84. And so uh, this is right when hip hop was really starting to become a bigger thing. And these records were coming over. But how are you, how are you getting them? Were they being in shops in London that you could buy? Yeah, there was a couple of import shops in London. Um, there was a shop called Groove Records where we would all go on a Friday afternoon. Um, and we would wait for the imports to come in because it was, you know, they would only get so many copies of a certain thing and you'd have all the other DJs in there waiting to buy them as well. So you had to be quick and competitive and just get in there at the right time. Um, and, you know, things like Sucker MCs by Run DMC for the first time on Profile coming in. Uh, you know, the, all of these early electro and rap records that were just incredible, like Hip Hop Bebop by Man Parish and, you know, these different records. Was this stuff accepted immediately, or, you know, when you were DJing, or was it a little bit of a hard sell to get people uh, behind it? No, it was the once the night we played at the Electric Ballroom, um, we, you know, the, it, the, they went mad. People loved it. They tore the roof off, and the other DJs were playing a lot of sort of fifties and rare grooves and Northern Soul, which had been kind of like a stable diet of that, of work, that sort of underground scene at that point. And Morris and I just took, you know, we had also decided that um, we would invest in some equipment and rather than, you know, we were still young and we were kids and we thought, right, well, what, what's the future? And the future is DJing and music and we Technic turntables suddenly appeared and we thought we want those. So we bought four turntables, a DMX drum machine, two mixers, reel to reel TAC machines keyboard and set up a studio. Was this all through DMOB money that you were paying for this? This was through DMOB money and, you know, I worked uh, I, I worked in a vegetarian restaurant in Battersea and, uh, you know, I had so income coming in and we were just, we were kids, we didn't drink then much or anything or go out much, we just were obsessed with music so it's kind of like we practice all the time and uh, practice cutting and scratching and mixing and learning how to use equipment. You were some of the few uh, DJs that were cutting and scratching in that way in the UK at that time, as far as I understand it, at least. Is that...? Yeah. At that point in London, we were probably the two of the first white kids to, um, to em embrace the cu that culture and uh, just re really immerse ourselves in it. And that's how we met you know, the, the, the likes of Malcolm and, and McLaren and stuff because th through Tom Bins and uh, he would come down to our parties at Battlebridge Road and I had meetings with Malcolm uh, where he would want me and my brother to take over as a &R people for different labels and things like that because we were then being asked to remix records and mix compilations. Um, and he kind of knew and could see that we were cutting edge. We would have people like Massive Attack, the whole band come along to our nights at Battlebridge and sit on stage behind us and watch us DJ and cut and people like Jazzy B and you know a lot. The, the, some of the Clash would be in there, all Joe Strummer was in there a lot and Mick Jones and some of the Sex Pistols, Paul Cook used to come um, and you know so it was like a vibrant crowd. Nana Cherry did our bar, you know she was our bar girl, her and Andrea Oliver and I would give them 500 quid on a Friday and they would go down to Acton and get a load of beer and alcohol, set that up on the stage on one side, set the decks up on the other side, fill the whole room with camouflage material and turn out all the lights. Um, and then we would let about four or 500 kids in there and 
it was crazy. Battle Bridge Road. Battle Bridge, it was called, yeah. And Sean Oliver DJed with me and my brother Morris. And Sean played the bass for the Slits and Rip Rig and Panic. Um, and basically, you know, it was he was a dread guy, dreadlock guy. Um, he died from sickle cell, Sean, because he he, he got ill with sickle cell disease, the disease. But um, we were quite wild, and you know, Morris and Sean would go off to Berlin, even back in in those days, and DJ in Berlin, and do little one-off parties, and I'd hold the bells and kind of like bring a guest maybe in and to play with me at Battle Bridge. And then one night we turned up after about six months of it and the police were waiting for us outside. Uh, You'd been doing this party weekly for about been, six months. Yeah. In this, uh, it was an abandoned warehouse? It was an, it was an abandoned school hall behind King's Cross Station in, uh, in, in Battle Bridge Road. Uh, and so that's what it was. It had wooden, wooden floors. So there was a great sign in there. And we would put the, the turntables up on cement blocks up on stage. And the stage was wooden as well hiring a really good sound system. So, you know, the quality of the sound was really good for that period of time. And Morris and I would cut a lot of records up and, you know, Nellie Hooper, as I say, and all these people would be there and they just used to sit and watch and they loved it and it was electric. And then the police showed up one day. Yeah, the police came one day because it was illegal um, and they had got wind of thousands of kids turning up at this street behind King's Cross Station. So they, they sealed the road off, actually cordoned the road off and threatened to arrest anyone who came through the, the cordon. Uh, this had happened to us before. It, at, there was a, we did a club called the Speakeasy and Substation. Substation was another illegal venue which was held in another underground basement by the D-Mob guys. It was also a really incredible event. I mean, you know, people like Sade would come there and dance in front of us at 6, 7 a.m. in the morning. There was a lot of things going on there. We had a little bar. We put sawdust all over the floor and the turntables away up on a little mezzanine. And, you know, a lot of movers and shakers from London, Don Letts and people like that would all be there on a weekly basis. Don Letts actually shot the AEIOU video for Freeze there. Um, so, you know, and it was an amazing venue. But once again, Paul, we, we actually got shut down because of Paul Foote from the Daily Mirror and the local residents, they made a complaint and they were waiting on us one night outside with loads of placards and the police suddenly appeared. So we, we they chased us actually, we, they, we had to run. They so chased they, you? Yeah, the, the police came after us, they wanted to arrest us and they were vexed, you know, um, that all of this had been going on and they didn't like our attitude. So there was a lot of drugs going on at these clubs as well. And, in, and at that point in time in the mid eighties in London, our biggest problem was heroin dealers. You know, the heroin dealers would usually take over the girls' toilets and deal from the girls' toilets. And that used to be a slight problem, but you know, that was the drug of speed and, and heroin was the drug of sort of choice then and a bit of LSD or acid, but uh, then was, it changed. This was before uh, ecstasy had come to the UK basically. In, in mass, at the very least. Yeah, yeah, this is before E, this is before e ecstasy. Um, you know, that the ecstasy scene kind of started to happen in London around about 1988, 1980, late 87, 88, and I think a lot of the kids who were coming back from New York or Ibiza uh, had discovered ecstasy and also, you know, the house music culture and the Balearic culture that was happening then on, in Ibiza kind of played a major impact in that. And at that point in time, around 1988, Mar Morris, Morris had actually gone to live in New York full time at that point. And I carried on delirium with Robin King uh, at Heaven and then at the Camden Palace, which is now Coco. You, even before that though, you were in New York. Uh, traveling there a bit and seeing the clubs there. What kind of impact did seeing what was going on uh, in New York have on, you know, when you came back and what you did subsequently? It had a huge impact, you know. Uh, Morris took me to, like, the Paradise Garage and took me to Choice. Choice wouldn't even open until 6 a.m. And you would go in to, and sit there at these tables in this kind of really bizarre warehouse party 
and there was no alcohol allowed. And it was, you know, it started at 5, 6 a.m. in the morning. And I think Roger Sanchez was the house DJ, uh, the, the resident DJ, and I'd never even heard of him then. And he would play a lot of dub, sort of, he would start using his sets with kind of like Grace Jones and a lot of like early post-industrial dub and electronic music. And then gradually it would build into, you know, disco and the classic loft kind of sounds and the place would fill up and everyone would dance and you know it was a wild atmosphere the garage as well was wild you know you, they they would levan would turn out the lights for maybe 10 minutes 15 minutes and it, you couldn't see anything and you know the music would stop and everybody would just be buzzing around and it would be weird and then suddenly you would hear that boom and that beat and then the lights would gradually go up and the place just was going off the hook and they had a little cinema in there that used to have a curtain just across as well. And, you know, they, you, you couldn't go into the cinema <laughs> if, you, if you know, if you get my drift, um, unless you were of a certain equate, you know, uh, if you wanted, it was very sexual, what was going on in there. And they, they did have the big glass bowls of punch on the bars and they were all laced with, I don't know what they had in them, something. <laughs> yeah. but I mean, it was like tripping. You would be tripping after you'd have a couple of these these cups of this this juice, and it was like early kind of MDMA and ecstasy, and you would lose your bodily kind of like functions. And but it was brilliant, you know. It was mental. It was scary as fuck, but it was it, it was brilliant. <laughs> and also listening to Larry Levan playing this incredible disco music and the way it was played and. The loops, they used reel-to-reels a lot as well, and the edits of, of things which were just incredible. I mean, I would go to another club called The World and watch Frankie Knuckles and Larry Levan play there, and, um, you know, they would have a lot of stuff on loops as well, just on tape, and it, it would go on all night. And about 6 a.m., 5 a.m. seemed to be the time in New York where it really started to kick, and it really got got busy and everybody really started to get into what was happening because they didn't drink alcohol. You know, they took drugs and uh, th they had energy. Um, the alcohol wouldn't sap their energy so they'd be up all night. They'd just be getting going about 5 a.m. and these parties would go on for two days, you know. One of the things you said earlier uh, was uh, at the Battle Bridge uh, parties, the sound was quite good for that time period. And I wonder if when you went to the Paradise Garage and heard that sound system, you must have thought, okay, this is actually an amazing uh, sound system and this is how it should be done. Yeah, but we, as I say, at that stage, Robin and Robin King and I had already taken Delirium to heaven and we had a Richard Long system installed in heaven. And he's the same guy who did the Paradise Garage yep. system. Yep. Um, so basically the sound system at heaven that we had at our disposal was incredible. And we took the club over every Thursday night. And I would bring over DJs like Frankie Knuckles for the first time he'd ever been in the UK. We brought Frankie over and he ended up staying with us for two months and becoming resident with me at the club. And I learned a lot from Frankie Knuckles DJing with him. You know, he would give me records and albums of things that were priceless and acapellas by, you know, black singers that you just could never get or find anywhere. Um, and also just the way he played his music and, you know, records, you know, like the Isley Brothers Inside You, parts one and two on the 12 inch. And, things like that, the 10 minutes of pure disco funk, but he would glide it all smoothly in and mix it all together incredibly well. And just sitting watching him, it was a great learning curve for me. You were coming from that hip hop, I guess, DJing style where you're doing quick cuts. Yes, I'd come, I'd come from the hip hop uh, background because Morris and I had mixed the Electro album series and um, you know, hip hop in the 80s and mid 80s, around 84, 85, 86, was the prevalent kind of choice of, of music that all the kids wanted to hear when they would come to the big clubs on a Saturday night. You know, we opened Delirium at, it's well known, we opened Delirium at, at the Astoria, and our opening night we had LL Cool J, the Beastie Boys, Houdini, and I think Run DMC, all on the same bill. Not exactly house music. No, no, not at all. And, you know, then 
the following week, I think we had Chuck Brown and the Soul Searchers. Then the following week after, we had DJ Cheese. Uh, then we had Schooly D and Code Money. So it, we were we were bringing in people who were making cutting like Schooly D had just released Gucci Time and PSK, uh, and we wanted these black American artists to come in and you know bring them into a bigger, wider audience in the UK, uh, and they wanted to play for these crowds too. So it, it was cool. I wanted to ask about this kind of moment where your own personal tastes and uh, I guess interest moved from hip hop more strongly to house. Because I, I get the sense that if you were playing house to an audience that was knowing you just for the hip hop stuff, it must have been an interesting transition. Yeah, I mean, because we, Morris and I were DJing every Saturday night at the Astoria on Charing Cross Road and it held about two and a half thousand, three thousand people. And we would turn away nearly two, three thousand. It was so popular, it was packed. Um, but these kids were coming from every part of London. And, you know, a lot of, our, our crowd then was very mixed, you know, it was, a, uh, I'd say, 70, 30%, 60, 40% black and white, you know, so we had, a lot of kids who were into the hip hop culture and wanted to hear hip hop and wanted to hear music that was related to that culture. And uh, when we changed, the, the, Morris had decided that when he'd been to New York and gone to the garage and he'd come back just with a big parcel of, of disco and early house and he said, look, this is it, we have to change and, you know, um, I don't want to play hip hop anymore. It's boring. Also, it's becoming more violent. I don't like the aggressive tone of some of the crowd, and we've got to change this. Clubbing should be a fun experience, and you know, I don't like the. the, the he didn't particularly like the, the the vibe that was beginning to occur, and we decided we needed to change that. What did you think when Morris came back with these house records when you first heard him? Were you immediately falling in love with it? Yeah, I kind of like, I, I was still into my hip hop and much more than my brother. But, um, you know, yeah, when I started listening to them and then when you listen to the roots of those records as well, like Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes, Bad Luck, the 12 inch of that, and the, re -ed the edits of that, you know, and it's just an incredible experience and an incredible feeling to, to hear that music. And I fell in love with it as well, not as quickly as my brother and not as obsessive as my brother. Um, but when we went and we, we, we left the Astoria eventually because we had problems with the management, um, they were complaining about our crowd. They said it was too black and they said that they didn't spend any money behind the bar um, and they wanted them out. And we thought that's racist, we don't like this and we don't like your stance. They were gangsters and basically uh, we left and at this stage as a group who were running the club we kind of went separate my brother moved to New York and got married in New York and then had a child there and stuff and um, he never came back really uh, and I stayed in London and Robin and I took delirium to heaven on the Thursday nights so tell me about the genesis of delirium at heaven Heaven was already a club that existed. You had been there before. And I'd you been, quite liked it, right? Yeah, I'd, I'd, when I discovered Heaven, I, the first time I went to Heaven was to go and see New Order's first ever gig after Ian Curtis died. It was their first time playing a gig in, after his death. And I thought, wow, got to, got to go to this. Where is this club Heaven? And a friend of mine, Ruth, who I, I live with in Hollywood, who is now in London with us, her and I took a lot of magic mushrooms and acid and we got on the tube and we went to heaven and basically we were tripping even on the train on the way there but when we got into heaven I was just like fuck this, this is like unbelievable this club I mean it was just incredible the star bar upstairs was all you know, lit up and you know it just had this electric vibe about it and the fact that it was a gay club and the it reminded me of a New York club. It reminded me of the garage. You know, it reminded me of that kind of vibe. And I thought, wow, this, this I, oh, I've got to do something here at this club. This place is incredible. But it was years later before we moved there and took on a night because when Heaven opened, it was a predominantly gay venue and they wouldn't do straight nights. So that's why we did the, the Thursday night because we, they wouldn't give us Friday or Saturday because they were predominantly gay nights. Um, 
So we said fine, and it was a bit of a risk moving from a Saturday to a Thursday, but it worked. And, you know, as I say, we'd bring in Jelly Bean Benitez, the DJ, Derek May, Frankie Knuckles, Todd Terry. Uh, so we had thousands of people coming. And then we'd have people like, you know, the Ramplings, Danny Rampling and Jenny Rampling, before that even started Shum, and people like Andy Weatherall and people like that, all sitting on the speakers with their ponchos on, watching us and what we were doing. And we didn't realize they at all sort of we were, we're discovering the ecstasy and the scene in Ibiza as well. And then, and Paul Oakenfold used to come and sit with me in the booth, but he was still kind of hip hop orientated. Um, and I, I made sure that the music policy downstairs was strictly house and the music policy upstairs was, was hip hop still. So that there was an alternative for both sets of people. Um, so you know, we'd have Africa Bambara come and DJ and that was fun because putting Bambara in the star bar in a gay club on a Thursday night in London and he was just part of this massive New York hip hop culture was odd at the time and people were like, wow, I'm crazy. But you know, they loved it and they-, it they must they, have been a little was, bit of a culture shock for them. It was a culture the shock. Artists. It was, I mean, I, I, we put Cash Money, DJ Cash Money up there and he was a hard nut from the Bronx. He was a real tough nut, and he was a bit like, hey, dude, you know, um, what's, what's going on here with these, these dudes in this club, you know? And I'm like, look, dude, you know, it's a gay club, um, and we have house music downstairs, hip hop upstairs. You're going to be fine. No one's going to bother you. You know, <laughs> just do your thing, enjoy yourself, and, and have fun, you know? And I'll talk to you later, you know? And later on, after they'd done their set and they were amazing, they blew the, blew the place apart. Um, he was like, wow, thank you so much. This, I loved this, it was fantastic. And Bambada loved it as well, you know, so it was cool. Yeah. You mentioned uh, earlier the word subculture, and I wanted to kind of come back to that a little bit. Was this subculture at that point? Because, I mean, you said you were turning well, away the, two to 3,000 people. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, I met so many amazing people at that point in my life, and I was still only 26, 27 years old. So I was a kid, but I was going, you know, we were, we were, I was then asked to produce and DJ for independent bands like The Age of Chance, um, who I did join and who I mixed a couple of albums with, and then I toured with The Age of Chance and joined them as a, a, an indie rock band, and I would scratch and cut and we would go to festivals all over Europe. It was amazing. And there, w there was so many amazing things happening. You know, we were getting asked to go to New York City by Comme de Garçon um, as models and walk in fashion shows. And we did a show and one of the models with us was Jean-Michel Basquiat, the artist. And Jean-Michel had been a friend of friends of, of ours in New York. So we knew Jean-Michel and man, we take serious amount of drugs. And it's kind of like Jean would never get up until like 4 p.m. in the afternoon. And then he'd go to Warhol's studio and paint. And then we'd all hang out and mix and go out with Malcolm as well in New York and go for dinner and then go to clubs. So there was a whole, yeah, it, now the subculture, it's regarded as subculture. And last year I did an exhibition at the ICE, for the ICA gallery in the mall. And it was called Subculture Offsite. Uh, and it was celebrating the fact that these things that happened artistically, fashion-wise, music-wise, and film-wise in the 80s had a massive impact on what is happening now in the culture of today in design, film, music, and art. And it was an incredible exhibition. I mean, you know, we had vitrines where I had the collection of books and uh, artifacts from that period and old flyers from Delirium. Um, and then sh we showed a film of Run DMC and the Beastie Boys live at Delirium that night because we all we had it on film, and also Nana Cherry and you know looking after Run DMC and driving them around London in Tessa from the Slits's old Morris Minor car, and it's mad footage. And Gregor Muir, who's the director of the ICA, said to me, "Noel, this is now archival art, and basically you are." an archival artist and you should think of this as that thing and we want to carry this forward and we want to do something with this and that's how I met the test pressing guys because they were doing the Ibiza Q exhibition with too many DJs 
and they, we were all at the, the opening party and they said, Noel, would you like to be involved and do something and carry this through with us? And I thought, yeah, I would. So that's what I'm, for next year, that's what I'm working on and that's what I've been doing this year and getting all of these things together, which we're turning into another film, exhibition, book, compilation albums, blah, blah, blah. What is it like to look back on this stuff? Um, I mean, I imagine in some sense that at the time you probably felt like this is amazing, but did you know exactly how special it might be viewed nowadays? No, I didn't, not at all. I, I, it's quite amazing what's happened and that I'm so glad that I kept all of these artifacts that I have. I mean, I've got Rick Rubin's original little card you know, as we, hey, here's my card. When I met him in New York with the Beastie Boys and stuff and kind of hung out with them and I ended up DJing with the Beastie Boys at private parties in London and, and in New York and I'd written a column for ID Magazine at that point. So I said, look, I, I want to fly to New York and hang out and they can pay for this and I'll do blah, blah, blah. And they, yeah, cool. Um, yes, yeah, so it, it, it was, it, it, sorry, it was kind of... No, uh, it was just... Kind of yes, it, 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 the, the, the thing that has now become... Yeah, it's scary in a way, though, as well, because you, you realise it's 30 years old. It's 30 years ago. Am I that old? And has this all happened? And where is the time gone? And, wow, it is amazing. But it's kind of like... It's really cool that it's regarded in the, in the vein that it is. You know, in the exhibition at the ICA, you know, my vitrines were beside Tracy Emmons' vitrine and... Uh, you know, Gilbert and George and um, Matthew Clark, the ballet, ballet dancer, and uh, just an incredible group of artists and people. And for to be regarded and asked to contribute and become an artist alongside people like that is amazing. One of the things that I find very fascinating in all of your talking about names, you're saying the Slits and then the Beastie Boys and then, you know, Rip Ring and Panic, these are all very different sounds, but it all seems to cohere at that time. All of these people were mixing and talking to one another and creatively vibing off of one another. Was that your sense as well? Was that it was it just completely natural for these scenes to be interacting with one another? Yes, it was complete. I find it really natural. Um, and I think so did all the different people involved because you know the Beasties, when they came to London, we would go and hang out at an old pub on Portobello Road, an old Irish pub, and The Clash would hang out there, Joe Strummer and Mick Jones. I took the Beastie Boys to meet The Clash, actually. I took them to, to Mick Jones' house, and um, we all hung out together, and you know, Mick Jones was obsessed by the Beastie Boys and Def Jam. Um, they, as his band, B.A.D., then released a single on Def Jam, um, and just, you know, the Adam and the, the Beasties were, they were really into punk rock, remember? They had been originally a punk rock band. So they were, they loved The Clash and they loved Madness and I took them to meet Suggs and Chrissy Boy and we'd all hang out together, you know, and, and they loved that London sort of sub, that culture as well and that underground thing. And then basically, you know, black music at that point as well, the post-industrial stuff that was happening, um, just seemed, it was, you know, it was changing sound-wise and evolving into hip-hop and evolving into other different areas of, of black music. So it kind of felt really natural, you know? But it seems like house, specifically, was one of the dividing uh, genres. Because I remember in an interview you did, you talked about the Beastie Boys. They were not very excited about house music in the slightest. No. And your audience <laughs> that you talked about, uh, you know, where you were playing hip hop, they were like, no, this is not. Well, you know, Morris at that stage lived in New York. He knew the Beasties as well and Adam and the two Adams and, and Mike D. And basically they were like, hey man, you know, you guys are barking up the wrong tree with that music. It's like, that's, you know, and we were like, well, we, we're DJs and we work in the club scene and no, Actually, there's something is definitely happening here. I mean, to me, the, the whole culture of house music was similar to the whole culture, like of punk rock in the in the 70s, or 
the hippie movement in the 60s. It was a wave and a new form of, of, of youth culture and music, you know. With it also came a new drug, new fashions, you know, a new way of life. Any, anything that, that, that happens in that sort of sense uh, has to be regarded as a, as a, as a, a major um, happening culture-wise. Um, I know we're jumping around a little bit, but I do want to, you mentioned fashion again, I do want to ask you, how did you end up as a model again on the runway in New York? It, just because Morris and I were, we had long red hair at that stage, and uh, we were kids, and we knew people who knew Yuki and Peter who run Come to Carson in London, so we were asked to come to a, 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 sh a shoot and audition, and we thought, yeah, why not? I mean, uh, this could be fun. And out of it, Morris, my brother, actually ended up marrying a Japanese girl and working for Comme de Garçons full time in New York, in Worcester, in their flagship store. And we, you know, they flew us to Paris, New York, Milan, well, you know, so it was really good fun um, and something different. And you were meeting different people and it was just of a time when things were different and, you know, they've always had a different aesthetic as to their models and who wears their clothes. It's a Japanese, you know, very hawkish brand and still is. You know, it's funny because in London at the moment they own a building in Dover Street called Dover Street Market. And that's, that, this is crazy because that's where the ICA originally was based and started in the 50s. And artists like Richard Hamilton and some of the early, you know, like Andy Warhol and artists like that would come and exhibit there. And now that space is owned by Comme des Garçons and they share uh, test pressing and idea books are based there as well. And um, it's this whole new culture and it's, it's an amazing little setup. It's really, and not, not, it's really weird because a lot of people don't really know about it, but it's, it's over like six floors and it's an incredible building. Um, so it's seeped in artistic history, and it's just mad that all of this is still connected, you know? Yeah, it seems like the fashion and music industries are quite connected in a way, and you're one of the few people who actually was bridging that gap in both senses. Well, no, I mean, there's a lot of people have, are involved and have bridged the gap. I, I mean, we were just lucky and we were in the right place at the right time, and we knew the right people, and it was just off the time. But... Um, yeah, I mean, fashion and music has always gone hand in hand. I mean, I am obsessed still by the early 70s and David Bowie and Lowe and, you know, that whole experiment scene of Brian Eno and Talking Heads and, you know, it's just amazing. I went to see um, Tina Weymouth from Talking Heads last year in, in London in, at the 100 Club. And afterwards, I said to Flora, my girl, look, I really want to meet her and speak to her, you know, because this is important. And um, we ended up, she came out suddenly, and I, sp I just approached her and said hello and spoke to her, and then she was really friendly. And then she knew some people that I had known back in New York. And then she completely opened up, and we spent the whole night together and hung out and blah, blah, blah. And we were talking about this whole culture and scene and David Byrne and Brian Eno and Talking Heads and just the whole way it had changed everyone's lives and also how fashionable it was as well, you know. Um, fashion has always been a major part of music culture and vice versa, you know. I mean, it's, it's it, it, one doesn't really exist without the other, to be honest. What did you get up to in the 90s? <laughs> We've talked so much about the 80s. I'm wondering, you know, where you went after, I guess, the way that I understand it, Delirium at Heaven kind of got taken over by another DJ, basically. Yes, we finished on the Thursday nights, uh, Robin and I, after about a year and a half, and then we took it to Camden Palace. But Paul Lokenfold at that stage then, he took our night over, and he called it Spectrum, or Land of Oz. And then he would do a Monday night and a Thursday night. And I, I was a little bit vexed at this point because I just thought, you know, man, you've just taken our crowd and stolen our ideas and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But he hadn't. He had done it entirely off his own back. He turned the whole place around. Uh, he actually, he pushed the whole acid 
ecstasy culture through his nights, Spectrum and Land of Oz. And I toured with Paul and DJed for Land of Oz with Nancy Noyes and, and, and Paul. And he was a lovely guy, Paul. He was an old friend. And he, what he did there was incredible. And then that culture just exploded and took off. So it was amazing and it was logical that somebody would come in and do that night. Um, we struggled at the Camden Palace, Robin and I, even though we put on some amazing events. We, you know, we put, brought over DJ Mark, the 45 King, for the first time to London, and we hosted a big event with MTV, uh, and you know, brought Derek May back over again to DJ the Orb, Andy Weatherall, and it, it was really amazing as well. It was some fantastic nights, but it was a huge club, and you know, it's Coco now in London. And to, to hold a Thursday night event there, just me and another guy running it, was very stressful. And you know, it was a, there was a lot of money and a lot of work involved. And we just gradually, Robin had decided that he wanted to leave London. And he moved and left as well and moved to Paris. So I was on my own. And at that stage, I just thought, well, I'm now working in Black Market Records during the day, DJing at Black Market playing music there all day, six days a week. Uh, you know, I need a break from this as well. So, and then basically I got asked to play every club all over the world, you know. I then traveled to Italy, Spain, Germany a lot, and France, and I, I guest DJ'd, basically. And are you still playing? Like tonight you're playing here in Belfast. What can we expect to hear? Are we going to hear classics or is it stuff that's coming out now? Or is well, it a maybe mix? a little mixture of both. But to be honest, I've been given mu a lot of new tracks by um, producers like Richard Seaborn, um, who did a track recently that Todd Terje had charted and stuff like that. He sends me on release material that he's working on. Some of it's like awesome. And I'm going to play that. Uh, and also, I edit things up on, on Logic and then put acapella, acapellas in a night um, and program my own beats and play keyboards and things like that on top of it. And I'll be mixing little beats and pieces like that in a night. Uh, but no, I, I love still embracing the new music. There's so many brilliant producers out there at the moment and house music's having a, a really amazing creative time again, a rebirth. So I've, it's actually, I've fallen back in love with house music and that whole culture after leaving Belfast again and moving back to London. Uh, so, you know, um, no, there'll be a, a lot of new music and some old music interspersed in between. Cool. I wanted to open up to questions, if you don't mind, uh, from the audience. No, no, no worries. Uh, does anyone have anything they'd like to, to ask of Noel? <laughs> we'll take that as a no, yeah. yeah there's, there's one right there. Yeah, yeah, I did. I came back and I played at the Art College for David Holmes. Um, I did two Sugar Sweet gigs, uh, and they were amazing, really, really incredible. And that was the first time I realized Northern Ireland and Belfast has totally changed. And I actually started feeling really comfortable coming back home and coming here. And I could see the whole change in everyone's attitude and, and the way people were coming together. And the part ecstasy and the drug culture was playing in that as well. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. And what David was doing and how that all progressed and the DJs that were coming in and playing from Boys Own, like Andy Weatherall and Terry Farley and people like that. It was, it was amazing. It was, I thought, this is incredible that Belfast has changed and is coming up and through this, you know? So yeah, I did. Um, and then I came back to live here in the mid sort of noughties just for a couple of years to look after my mom. Um, and also to get out of London for a little bit. And then when I was here, I got involved in some of the local festivals, the Cathedral Quarter Arts Festival, etc. And out to lunch and would, you know, program, help bring over bands or DJs. So I loved it and it was a great little period as well. And it was nice to see, you know, I DJ with the, with the Fall and Dan Sack and the Public Enemy guys here in Belfast and had brilliant nights. So it's amazing how it's all come full circle and, and how it's evolved, uh, really good. Are there any other questions? Yeah, 
Yeah, I mean, you have to love your art and you have to study your art uh, and you have to become good at what you're doing. Um, otherwise, you get found out as a fraud because sooner or later, you're going to be asked to do something with other people who are really professional and who are dedicated to what they're doing and you'll get seen as a fraud. And, you know, I've always been, I, all I can really do is music. Uh, you know, it's, that's been the main, even at times in my life when I wanted to do other things, it seems that I always come back to music. And, you know, the, because of doing this, this work with test pressing, I've got two more big mixes to come out, interviews, say, lots of other things. I, yeah, you, you must, Morris and I practiced and really studied our art. I mean, people, you were just asking me about what I did in the 90s. In the 90s, I set up a recording studio and I released a lot of independent 12-inch singles and I had my own label, Join Hands, and then I got a deal with Warner Brothers and I signed a five-album deal with Sonia Son, who was my partner at the time, who was a spoken word artist from Brooklyn, New York. And then Sonia got her role in Martin Scorsese's Bringing Out the Dead, and then she went on to become Kima, the detective in HBO's The Wire and she wanted to leave the music business and Warner Brothers sort of changed tack and, and we lost the deal. But I didn't really mind at that time. It, it was cool working for a major record company was really hard work and stressful. You know, it was great. That's how I, I managed to build a recording studio. They paid for everything. And I had some great times doing that with Sonia. We shot two videos in Paris with Daft Punk's directors and stuff. So it was great fun. Um, so I learned how to engineer and program as well and how to use Neve desks and SSL and go into the studio. I could use samplers and I could do things with samplers that you didn't tell you about in the manuals. You know, you just discover yourself by different combinations of buttons, etc. So I, I immersed myself in into production and doing my music even then as a different because I I was, you know, the gigs were stopping to come as regular as what they had been because I was getting older, new DJs were coming through, you're not in fashion anymore, and, you know, things change. And I just thought, well, I've, I, I'm, what I want to do anyway from day one is, is produce music and at least try, you know. Even if I'm not successful at it, at least try and do what I've always loved doing. The fact that we got the five album deal with Warner Brothers and I released about 17 records, I'm happy with that, you know, it's like, so, and I met a lot of really new people as well through that scene, so it was cool, it was cool. You said just now that you always wanted to produce, maybe more than you wanted to DJ, even, at the beginning? Oh no, not at the beginning, at the beginning, I, you know, I, I, when I got the, when I started DJing, I fell into DJing, as I say, Morris and I, really purely by accident, but then when I got the bug, Man, you know, I, I lived for DJing, I was obsessed. My brother was very obsessed. Morris, you know, would practice eight hours a day on the turntables and he would program and do different He was obsessed. He had, he had double copies of every record, you know. Um, obviously living in New York, he was able to buy them cheaper and get the classics. I've still got some of his collection and it's all promo 12 inch material from the 70s and some of it was Larry, he ended up, my brother actually playing with Larry Levan at a club in New York, but the two of them would get very high and wasted and he would phone me at like 6 a.m. and go, you know, blah, 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 Larry can't see the labels and don't ever take ketamine, no, because, you know, there's a guy talking to the wall. And I'd be like, Morris, look, you know, it's 6 a.m., I'm sleeping, man, um, you know. <laughs> I mean, I mean um, and when he would come home to London sometimes to, to see me or whatever, uh, he wouldn't sleep, you know, he would be up all night, but he would be DJing and mixing and, you know, and then he kind of went off on a tangent, but obsessed, obsessed, totally, yeah. Are there any other questions? Yep. Well, uh, I don't know where I got the energy from. <laughs> um, it's just kind of like, uh, well, I, you know, 
I, I just, as a boy, I remember being about eight years old or nine years old and hearing the Beatles, Hey Jude, and asking my mum if it was okay if I, I couldn't go to school um, just for an extra 10 minutes so I can hear the outro of this record. And it touched me in this way that you know, this funny thing went through me and I thought, my God. And then I would go out and buy little seven inch singles on my way home from school. And my mum bought me a little Danzette turntable with a little arm on it and I would pretend to be a DJ and I would have my own little top 10. And I used to torture my poor mum because she'd be standing in the kitchen and I'd play my number one record 10 times over, you know, because it was number one that day or whatever. So I was always, I just became obsessed with music when I was young. And then seeing, you know, I would travel to London a lot, as I say, and then I would go and see bands like Cabaret Voltaire or the pop group in the Slits. And then I was meeting these people. So they were inspiring me, you know, to do better to work harder, to do something, because this is an opportunity that you, sh you can't waste. These opportunities only come along once in your life. So if you've got something like that happening to you, grab it by the, the, the hands and, and do it, you know? Um, and the, the, the scene that was created by them, I wanted to be with those people. They seem to get in everywhere for free. They seem to have all the coolest friends. They seem to be invited all over the world and they were making money. And they loved what they were doing, and I wanted that, you know. I, want, I didn't know anything else, and I just, we were very lucky, my brother and I. We were blessed, and to meet the people we met, and, the, you know, it was a fantastic opportunity. And it's still happening, you know, for example, Gregor Muir, who, who is the director of the ICA, is an old friend of mine to, uh, that I met through the music scene, and who really loved my brother. So, you know, it's quite incredible. I, I bumped into Rifak Osbeck actually just yesterday, the fashion designer, and he didn't remember me. And I said, Rifak, and he went, yeah. And I said, do you remember me? And he went, you're the, you're the boy from Black Market that used to sell me my records, all those house records, Ray's Break for Love. And I said, yeah, and then we were talking and got chatting and he had a new shop open in Notting Hill and he was standing outside it having a smoke. And we were just reminiscing about those days in black market records and like the pet shop boys would come in and, you know, uh, yeah, and then I would deal up the pet shop boys with all their music. And I'd give Chris, you know, I'd say, Chris, you need this 12 inch, this house track and blah, blah, blah. And they would spend 500, 600 pounds each session on music. So, you know, it was just kind of, it was just kind of mad, you know, and then people like, all the DJs would come in. All Har DJ Harvey used to come in. I used to play with Harvey a lot in London on a Sunday night at a club called Solaris. And it was cutting edge house underground club. Um, Harvey used to come in in the mornings and me and him would have breakfast together, coffee and a sandwich, and just talk about music and beats and torture each other, you know, um, before he went off to LA and became this superstar kind of like enigma that he is which is amazing because he's an amazing guy. So, you know. Was he always a character? Yeah, Harvey was always at, at a little bit left of field and always uh, mad. Um, he used to come in with his duffel coat on, him and Chucky. They always wore duffel coats and, uh, you know, and baggy sort of jeans. And they were hippies, you know, they were into rock as well. And uh, they had the Tonka sound system. And last year, actually, I did the Secret Garden Party and the Wilderness Festival with the Tonka Sound System guys, Chucky and, the, you know, Harvey came to one of them and Justin Robertson played and we did Glastonbury and we did all these different festivals. So, yeah, it was, it was amazing. Hopefully that kind of answered your question. <laughs> was that okay? <laughs> I nearly got there, yeah. But it, the people that I met along the way kept inspiring me. You know, your Nana Cherries, your Bruce Smith from the pop group, and Mark Stewart, um, Sean Oliver from Rig Rig and Panic, Malcolm McLaren, Tom Bins, Comme de Garçon, people and staff. You know, they just all continually aspired you to sort of reach a higher level. All the DJs that I met as well, you know, through the scene. And um, it was just, that's, it's just important to stay aware of what you're doing when you're doing something artistic and creative and not let yourself get waylaid by the, 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 the other side of it, which can take you to different places and you'll meet 
different people who are not so creative and who will latch on to you and create havoc for you in your life as well. You know, there is a lot of hangers on and there's a lot of people who kind of pretend to be something and that they're not, you know. And there's even people on the scene now who pretend that they did this and they did that. And I know they didn't because I was there and I was doing it, you know. But it's, it's cool. It's cool. Oh. Yeah, yeah, cool. That's, that's really amazing. That's good. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, it's nice to know that people are aware of it, you know, because sometimes I think nobody gives a monkeys anymore and nobody even took any notice of this, you know. Uh, but it, it's nice to know that some people cared, like yourself, and, and you're, you're here today. So thank you. It's really nice. I, I really appreciate that. So thank you. And thank you, no, right. for being thank here. Thank you, I really appreciate okay. it.